I am excited for our beer sponsor this week. But not just regular beer. Today we have root beer because we have a 12 year old root beer sponsor. We have Ethan here and Ethan is going to talk about a new app that he developed. Go ahead. All right. So the name of the app is Lazy Husband and basically it is your wife comes home and she asks, how do I look in this dress, mascara, insert, whatever. And so you just pull out the app and that you have your voice recorded and you just say, you look beautiful. So you don't have to actually go through the um, process of actually talking. All right, where'd you, get the, where'd you get the idea for this? My mom comes home with a stack of like dresses, about like 10, 20, 40, something like that. And I'm on my phone watching TV and she goes into her room, tries it on, comes out and is like, how do I look? And I'm like, you look great, playing on my phone. And so I do this a couple times and I realize, I hold in my hand a smartphone. So I record myself on video saying, you look beautiful, and I just play that, and I decided to turn that into an Yeah, app. yeah, it's genius. You're a genius. Okay, a lot of people don't have ideas this great, but a lot of people don't even have the skills that you do. So can you tell us a little bit about how you developed the ability to even program, or like what kind of technology this was based on? Well, basically, I was already playing on my computer a lot. I was always on my computer. Um, right. And my dad, Rick Duggan, is a programmer, and... Um, I went to uh, codeacademy.com and that's where I learned to program JavaScript and so that's where I learned it. It took me three or four months and I learned that and then um, we went into actually programming the app. That's amazing. Okay, and what technologies have you built it on? Uh, we used Xcode, we used PhoneGap so that we could do all different um, operating systems at once and uh, Twitter Bootstrap. Okay, so and you've got it submitted to all the stores right now, but it's not released, right? So you're going to be going to South by Southwest. And we're launching at doing... South by Southwest. Right. I'm going to be in the booth, so don't take me yeah, off. Okay, so you'll be you'll be inside a booth inside the Vegas Tech yep. area, right? So mm -hmm. people can actually at that point download it, demo it. Yep. Okay, now tell us about your website, what you're doing with this, and what you're doing with Twitter to promote before it launches. Um, my uh, the app Twitter is at Lazy Husband, so at Lazy Husband app, so everybody follow that. And um, the website is lazyhusbandapp.com, and it links to all of the um, different stores. Um, I'm going to be at the booth promoting for all of Interactive, and I can't go to the um, party, but I am. <laughs> <laughs> I am sponsoring them, so there's going to be a two foot by two foot lazy. Oh, you're sponsoring logo. them too? Yes. That's amazing. Okay, sorry. Keep going. And I'm. Um, I can't be there, but I'm going to have a computer running FaceTime showing me at the. <laughs> All right, well, give it up for Ethan, everybody. I'm really proud of him. Everybody check out his app. And Ethan, Ethan, Ethan. All right, well, we appreciate you coming out. You have some stickers for everybody, right? Yes, you want to go do. stand up there and throw some out? Yes. Guys, get lucky. This is the first run. These will be vintage one day. How far back can you get it? There you go. All right, good job. Thank you, Ethan. We're looking forward to the app. Thanks again for the beer sponsorship. All right, we're going to move on to our... Episode one still. Episode zero, dude. Yeah, well, that's secret. We've removed that from YouTube, so don't look for it. <laughs> Digital records are there forever, though. I know it's going to come back to Haunt us. us. All right, but let's start by talking to uh, Kat Kelly. So... <laughs> What was really a successful event was a hackathon that took place last Saturday, and we wanted you to come on the show and tell us just what the best hacks were, what really made this thing stand out, and why it got so much traction. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, first off, thanks for having me. And uh, so Vegas Hack, it was really a, a great event. We had a lot of different people, a lot of different backgrounds. We had a firefighter. We had a team from uh, Southwest Career uh, and Tech Academy, a high school team, uh, and so many different people. And that's really what kind of made the fabric of the event different from any other hackathon. Uh, so it's Ve Vegas Hack, just to back up, it's a monthly one-day event uh, focused on rapidly prototyping different ideas. Ideas. So people come out and they experiment with things that they're kind of working on, uh, and it's a good time. And we had a really good time uh, working with uh, the community, community sponsors. They, they really chipped in, and it was really a, an awesome event. Oh, so just tell us about a highlight, personal moment that you thought was your favorite. Uh, let's see. I think one of the, my favorites was someone used the Fitbit API. Okay. Uh, you know the little Fitbit yeah, yeah, things yeah, yeah. that shows yeah. how many steps you took during the day? They basically matched that with Super Mario Brothers and oh, made yeah. that. Yeah, it's oh, called uh, <laughs> Nintendo. And that was a really cool one. Uh, <laughs> right there in the back. Yeah. 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 
<laughs> round of applause. But I can't just single out that one. There are, there yeah. are so many other ones that use uh, data from the CDC or the Homeland Security API. There, there was a lot of different different things because we partnered with Code for America, right. um, and that was that was a really good partnership. Over 50 d developers, designers came out. It was it was a really good time. Okay. Well, I'm excited, and I'm sure it'll be back next year. With is it yearly? Or it's, is a it monthly monthly? Event. Oh, monthly. it's a monthly oh, event. Oh, monthly event. So so we're great, looking to great. do two things. We're looking to grow this event uh, to have it be a sustainable, community-driven hackathon, and we're looking to just foster as many aha moments for Vegas Tech as we possibly can with this event. So, All right. Uh, that's, that's Vegas Tech. All right. Speaking about aha moments, <laughs> uh, we have a new sponsor for the South by Vegas, and or it's just Vegas Tech, but at South by Southwest, and that's uh, Rich's company, Roll Tech. So I was wondering if you could first tell us um, what you're doing with your company and what you're looking to promote. So um, Roll Tech is at the forefront of a booming industry. You mentioned Fitbit. It's called Quantified Self, which is basically humanity's fascination with tracking their own stats. Um, okay. How many steps you take, how well you brush your teeth. It's, I think there's all kinds of uh, companies and apps forming around that type of activity. And so with Roll Tech, we have an advantage because bowling activity is already passing through computers. Uh, you know, when you see your scores on the monitors above your head, it's passing through a server, but up to this point, it's just been dumped in the virtual trash heap. So with Rolltech, we've made the right partnerships and developed the technology to allow us to grab all that data in real time, and once we grab it, we can do all sorts of stuff with it. We can report people's stats back to them in real time with their scores. We can give them points for their performance on the lanes. Um, we can share with friends. We can allow people to compete globally, uh, virtually, from the comfort of their home center. And then there's also a big data side of it. Since we turned the thing on in October, we're in two centers right now. Uh, we've captured almost 5 million ball throws and 300,000 games. Nice. And this is data that's never been captured before, never been analyzed. And if you look a little deeper, every one of those ball throws has a name, a gender. Uh, if you dig a little deeper, socioeconomic status, location. And so there's all sorts of stuff that we can do um, for the bowling industry as a whole and then also for this huge, enormous untapped data set. And so are you a B2B play or are you hoping that people at South by just regular people who like to bowl download your app and start using it to keep score? So we're B2B and B2C. Okay. Um, we've developed a, a back-end portal for the bowling centers that allows them to tackle their biggest problem, which is they have no idea who's in their bowling center. In, you know, in real time, they can't market to the people in their center. So we developed something that allows them to push deals and messaging to their bowlers in real time. So we have kind of a play um, to both sides. At South by Southwest, um, really, uh, you know, we want to promote ourselves. We just launched a few weeks ago. Um, and so we're just starting that slow climb to profitability yeah. and user um, you know, acquisition. Um, so we're going to you know, get noticed and talk to the press, but also you know, to be part of the community that's going there. It's a really special time to go as part of this oh, community and see yeah. what's going on. So it's yeah. the whole the That's whole a good product. You know, I know my mom's still got like, my first bowling score like, in some <laughs> piece of plastic. <laughs> well, you know, there's, but, you know, I'm glad. I mean, people do love to keep track of that stuff. So. And there's 100 million bowlers in the world, and there's 3 million league bowlers in the US, and yeah. the average league bowler spends about 1000 bucks a year, and we're $5 a month. So. Okay. All right, well, Melissa, I want to talk to you about an article that rethinks the way office space works. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit just about what you took from the article and what you think a good message would be for everybody here. Well, um, I think something that they were trying for downtown, which the article explained, is having more collisions, and it's a big part of the Zappos mentality, as well as downtown. And it said that the most innovation happens when different industries collide, which is a great example of stuff that does happen downtown, like technology and green colliding, or technology, or even just like you know, in food industry plus you know, sustainability or stuff like that. But a lot of these industries colliding, that's when the most interesting things happen, and the article explains that a bit, and just creating this what do you call it, a collision bowl of like yeah. kind of what downtown is. So it was very interesting, okay. definitely. All right, so I think that's pretty much it. Do you remember your first bowling score? Uh, Kyle, any I memory? don't. Maybe yeah. 100. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, better. Well, 100 out of? Probably at the bumpies on that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Anyways, all right, so that's it for the news section. We're going to bring Lindsay up next to talk for uh, or talk about Code for America. So Woo! thank you guys. I appreciate you coming yeah, out. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Balance 
and she has a pretty impressive history. So she single-handedly decided to put a colored halo on Barack Obama's head. Uh, single-handedly, no, okay, sure. Not yeah, single that was totally but She was in the room when Newsweek <laughs> actually published that. So she was the art director at first, and then later became the what's your final title? Director? Design director. Oh, design director at Newsweek. Mm -hmm. But she's here today because she's a fellow with the 2013 Code for America campaign. So mm -hmm. um, we brought her in. We want to first hear just a little bit about what Code for America is and how it affects everyone down here. Sure. So Code for America is a nonprofit organization. It's been around for about three years now, started by Jen Palka, who actually has a really great TED Talk about uh, government and technology. And the, the general idea is that, you know, government should be innovative. And uh, the civic space, the startup space is very innovative. And how can you sort of find a way to marry those worlds and take the energy, you know, and the sort of philosophy that comes from the startup world um, this idea of, you know, rapid ideation and, um, and just rapid prototyping and trying new things and sort of infuse that into government, uh, which sounds, you know, may, may sound sort of easy on, you know, yeah. relatively easy, but it's, it's actually in, in practice not very easy. Um, so she had this vision of, again, of doing just that. So she started this fellowship model that was based off uh, Teach for America, which I think okay. uh, right. people yeah, are pretty familiar with. Teach for America people, yeah. So, you know, and Teach for America sort of infuses these professionals in these um, areas which basically need them the most, right, the urban, urban cities. So Code for America, which is sort of dubbed, uh, what is it called? Uh, what, Peace Corps for Geeks. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> uh, so this follows that same model, where you bring in professionals, um, developers, uh, urban planners, designers, researchers, uh, anthropologists, uh, policy people, who have, you know, had professional experience, and you're actually bringing them into these cities, um, local governments, and. Uh, giving them a year to basically infuse themselves in that city, in the culture, and really try to change um, that culture right. and try to infuse that sort of startup philosophy within that. Um, the end result is somewhat based on these apps that we built, d digital platforms that either help a city work better internally or uh, externally, public-facing apps that okay. you know help the city interact better with its citizens. Okay, and so did you choose to come to Las Vegas, or was this kind of a random lottery thing? Or yeah, how so did you? Code for America. So sorry about that. So okay. the reason I'm here in the first place is uh, Las Vegas is one of nine cities that uh, signed up for the Code for America Fellowship this year, and there's 29 fellows uh, over nine cities. So. I actually, Las Vegas was my first choice. Okay. So. And what projects are underway right now? So what can we expect as like a tangible product? Like if you guys are successful, what will be different about the city when you leave than when you came? Uh, we're going to install a giant dome over Las Vegas so that oh. we can control the temperature. Oh, jeez. Let me go in there for a second. I know. Just thinking about this wonderful dome. Yeah. Because we hear that temperature is like the biggest yeah. issue you guys have here. Uh, no, actually... <laughs> Actually, uh, right now we're here for the month of February in a sort of a research process. So we've talked to, I would say, probably over 150 people um, okay. within the month. Um, people within city government, um, people outside of city government, the tech community, and uh, the downtown project has... Well, it, the Downtown Project is actually one of our funders, and they've been very generous in terms of opening us opening us up to uh, the community. Right. Well, that's good. You guys. Um, so, to, to your point, uh, we don't actually, we're not actually working on anything quite yet. Oh, okay. Uh, we're, Still assessing. We're researching and we're assessing. The, the uh, interesting, um, I guess, unique dynamic about Las Vegas in particular is uh, Las Vegas signed up for this fellowship under this umbrella, this general um, umbrella of economic development and revitalization of downtown yeah. Las Vegas. Uh, so 
it's pretty broad, and right now we're trying to, we've, we feel like we've collected a lot of information, um, collected a lot of stories, collected a lot of experiences from people, and we'll now get to the point where we can sort of drill down and see what we can accomplish in, you know, within the next year. Okay. And if somebody has a great idea for the way the government should be changed, a hackathon, is that the best way to kind of share their idea and kind of demonstrate what's possible? Yeah. Well, the other part of um, Code for America, which started with the fellowship, it's now branched into actually four, um, four initiatives. One of the initiatives is this uh, Code for America brigade that we started um, probably about a year ago. There's, okay. I think, 27 across the country, 27 different cities. And uh, the brigade is, like you said, there's sort of, it's actually volunteer-based. It's people in the city, so it's very different from what we're doing, which is, you know, sort of these visitors coming in from outside of the city. Um, mm -hmm. The brigade's volunteers of people who live here. And they are sort of keeping a watch and um, consistently, I guess, working on uh, apps and in gotcha. the civic space. Okay. All right. Yeah. So we're almost out of time, but I have sure. to ask you about this uh, cover of Newsweek that Barack Obama was on. You, <laughs> you have to go back to Newsweek. You put a multicolored halo on him. He's promoting gay rights. How did that go through, and why was that such a big impact on you? Um, well, it was very fun because, frankly, the White House had to ask, had to answer a lot of questions. So about you guys it. like in a room, yeah. right? And you were like, you were like, we gotta embarrass him, or we gotta like. Just no, make no, no, some no, kind no. It wasn't. It wasn't a point of embarrassing him. It was, oh. uh, you know, he had come out uh, in favor of gay rights in a very sort of verbose way, um, and we had a you know great story about about that, and we wanted to create some sort of provocative cover that had him sort of own that moment. Yeah. Um, and what was interesting about it is it was actually the writer's idea to, to say, why don't you put a halo on him? Yeah, because just um, that slight hint. It wasn't overdone. Yeah. Right? It was just kind of that nudge that made and it work. And it was also to the editor's credit of uh, creating the headline of the first gay president. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and they responded, right, the White House? Yeah, well, it okay. made them sort of own that moment, yeah. which, um, you know, was we thought incredibly interesting. Uh, the well, idea of Newsweek was trying to, and the covers was trying yeah. to spark conversation, so that's what we did. You, know, you did a good job, and <laughs> I appreciate you sparking a conversation with these guys, Thank too. You. And we're glad to have you in the community and everybody. Sure. Uh, check out Code for America. So thanks for coming on. I appreciate sure. it. Thanks, Thank Lindsay. Thank you. <laughs> we'll start things off for the potential makers in the audience. Sinchop will be teaching a soldering class on Tuesday, March 5th, from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Learn how to solder and create a printed circuit board. All materials will be provided, but they ask that you bring your magnifiers and brain if you need or have them. The class is only 10 bucks, and you can sign up on meetup.com. Following that is the Drupal Users Group on March 13th at UserLib. Be sure to join them starting at 6.30 p.m. to go over all things related to Drupal, from just the basic uses of the CMS to API integration. On a funner note, Fremont East Experience and VegasForLocals.com are hosting the fifth annual St. Patrick's Day Pub Crawl on the 17th. Special offers will be available for those who RSVP on TicketGeek.com, and there's no cost to attend, but of course, it's only for those 21 up. Sorry, Ethan. <laughs> and for those music aficionados in the audience, be sure to head to Beauty Bar on April the 11th to check out Purity Ring. Their most notable song is Lofty Cries, and they'll be playing at 9 p.m. for those 21 and up. Be sure to grab your ticket now, as this show is almost sold out on TicketCake.com. Now let's head back to the table to hear about those, about something to do for those doers out there. What? All right, and, and definitely 1% of you will enjoy this next segment because we have brought in Sarah Evans, who's going to talk about a new campaign that her and Tracky have put together called 1% Doers. Give us the rundown. So at Tracky, we wanted to find a unique way to kind of play off the idea of 1% and make it a really positive thing. And we found that um, each year in the United States alone, based on studies that we've seen, the US loses $14 trillion in productivity in the business world. Um, maybe because of Twitter and Facebook, I don't know. <laughs> but um, the fact is that very few of us are actually really productive. We talk about what we want to get done, but the people who actually get things done are really just the 1% of people. So we launched this badge, the 1% of doers, and we created a quiz for people to take 
to kind of gauge what their productivity at work was, um, how they felt they were rewarded and re recognized, what motivates them to get work done, and the first word that popped in their head when they think of Benjamin Franklin. We don't oh, really okay. know why, but it was just a fun prompt. And I'm going to use some of those responses, like somebody put dollar dollar bill, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> So we'll do something with that. But for everyone who made the cut, they got this 1% doer badge. And our hope is that we'll start rewarding and recognizing people by what they're getting done, not just what they're talking about. And right. we'd like to see that spread. So as we're reaching out to these people who have we've deemed as 1%, we're asking for them to tell us um, who they think is part of the 1%. And also something unique, we invited everyone who submitted to the quiz to give us their boss's name and email and address. And if they qualified as 1%, I sent a personal email to their oh, bosses. Oh, really? So, yeah. So if you guys need it, just Good let me know. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, um, yeah. the, the sad thing was, in that quiz, about 80% of people said they felt unknown or unrecognized right. at work. Aww. And if they're part of the 1%, the only correlation I can make is that um, people take for granted that they just are going to get things done. It's become commonplace instead of... Right. Yeah, well, in fact, in fact, if you're not one part of the 1%, it seems like you might even have an interest in like keeping that person a secret and trying to take some of that credit. So, I mean, it's really good that you're doing this, and I think it's uh, going to help and make a big difference. So thanks of for coming course. on the show. I appreciate you. It's thanks. good to have you on. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Thank you guys for coming out to episode 14. <laughs> Downtown project Vegas we the hardest Yeah yeah Alright alright it's downtown we running this Rest of y'all just running lips Creeping on and come up tip They can share we in this bitch Tweet to your followers Remember like a flashback Vegas tech Don't forget to spell it with the hashtag